Good morning, everybody. My name is uh, James Kidd. I'm a partner in the Employment, Pensions and Immigration team, and I'm joined by... Uh, Kevin Lowe. I'm a partner in a tax team. And Kerry Ferris. I'm a senior associate in the tax team. And as the slide suggests, we're going to be talking about IR35 and off payroll working. Now, I say we, Kevin and Carrie are going to be doing the talking. I will interject occasionally and monitor the uh, Q&A. So let's get ready to rumble <laughs> what the kids are saying these days. <laughs> or 20 Kev years ago. <laughs> <laughs> wow. It's going to be like that, is it, Carrie? <laughs> Fine. Uh, Kevin, over to you. Thanks, James. So, um, what is off payroll working? Because a lot of people just default straight to um, IR35. Uh, IR35, as, as many of you will know, no longer exists as such, but the rules that are known as IR35 only apply to a portion of the off payroll working population. So, so what is off payroll working? Well, it's what it says on the tin, as it says there. Um, so people who do work for you, but are not paid through your payroll the obvious if you think about it but the tax rules vary depending on which entity or which person you contract with so this is where our first poll is going to come in be really grateful for you to um, give us an answer uh, on this so the poll is assuming you engage with off payroll workers who do you contract with? Do you contract with the individual, the individual's personal company, an agency, uh, or do you come across all of those situations or a combination of them? And 63% of it answered thus far. Do you want to give it another couple of seconds? Yeah, a couple of seconds. Yeah, that's sort of coming coming towards the close. And we, we clearly have, you know, if this was an ask the audience on who wants to be a millionaire, I think we'd have a clear answer there in that you come across a variety of these situations. So that's great because we're going to deal with all of them. I'll, sh I'll just quickly share the results so everyone can see. Very strong. Okay. Yeah. Move OK, on. yeah. So let's look at who you contract with. So if you contract with the individual directly, and, and I'm using you throughout this, as I'm sure Carrie will be doing, to, to mean the end client, I'm assuming that as this, as this uh, session is focused on in-house uh, lawyers or in-house people, HR, etc., uh, that we're dealing with people who engage with the contractors. There might be some contractors on as well. So apologies that I'm not speaking directly to, to you for some of this. So if you contract with the individual directly as a self-employed individual, then the IR35 rules do not apply. There is no intermediary. You as the client must determine the tax status. You must uh, apply the rules correctly and you must pay the right amount of tax if you think that that person is an employee for tax purposes. That has always been the case. Those rules did not come in uh, at any point in the last 10 years or so, like some of the others that we're going to talk about, but um, they've always been there. We'll talk about how to determine tax status uh, in a minute uh, when we've looked at the what the rules mean for um, situations where you contract with the intermediary and with the agency. So if you're contracting with direct with the person's personal services company, then you as the end client must apply the IR35 rules. And Carrie's gonna run through what those are in a moment. If you contract on the other hand with an agency, that's where it gets a bit more complicated because what rules apply will depend on who the agency contracts with. If the agency is using one of their own employees, then sort of happy days for you, because clearly uh, taxes are being deducted uh, by the agency under the payroll. 
If the agency is contracting with an individual on a self-employed basis, then a set of rules called the agency rules apply. And these are different to IR35, and I'm going to look at those for you in a moment. But broadly speaking, uh, they apply a set of rules if the individual is providing their personal services and there is supervision, direction and control. You don't have to go through the whole tax status determination uh, in those situations. And finally, if the agency is contracting with uh, as a personal services company, so through contracting with an individual through their own company, then you as the end client must apply the IR35 rule. So as we'll, as we'll see when we look at some of the practical issues surrounding agency, you're going to need to know that. You're going to need to find out what the situation is. So let's have a look at what IR35 is. Carrie. Yeah, so I'm just going to do a bit of a refresher really um, about what the IR35 rules are and um, sort of how they came about, just a bit of the background to them. Um, because these rules were introduced over 20 years ago now in 2000 to tackle the use of intermediaries. So most commonly personal service companies, as Kevin's mentioned, to avoid tax. HMRC talks about disguised employment. So basically it, it's tackling situations where you have a person who is doing the same job in the same way as an employee, but they're contracted and paid through a separate interme intermediary. Um, so they don't have tax and national insurance deducted at source through PAYE. And that has certain tax advantages um, because obviously there are different tax regimes for personal and business income. So the IR35 rules only apply, as Kevin's mentioned, where you have an intermediary. And the, the key points here is that you have to have an individual personally performing services for a client through an intermediary most commonly a personal service company, but we do see other forms occasionally. It could be a partnership or even another individual if you're contracting with that individual and they are then contracting with the person who's doing the work. Um, and then the second part of the test is that the individual would be an employee or an office holder of the client for tax purposes if you took the intermediary out of the equation. So you look at the sort of hypothetical relationship between the person doing the work and the end client and say, well, actually in practice, is what they're doing, what an employee would be doing. And we'll go into more detail about the factors that you look at um, a bit later on. But just sort of going back to the beginning, so IR35 obviously came in in 2000. And then as you'll all know, um, there've been various changes to that in the past few years. So firstly, in 2017, with the reforms that just applied to the public sector, which were then rolled out to medium and large businesses in the private sector. Um, a bit of confusion was was caused uh, late last year. Um, I think it's worth mentioning because I've, I've had a few people who weren't aware um, of what ended up happening, but Kwasi Kwarteng's mini budget um, announced that they were proposing to repeal the changes that were introduced in 2017 and 2021 to IR35, but that was very quickly reversed when Jeremy Hunt came in as Chancellor, um, along with most of the rest of the mini budget. So IR35 is still very much in force and it's, it's not going anywhere, at least for the time being. James, if we could just have the next slide, please. Yeah. So before I get into the detail of how the IR35 rules work, um, it's worth mentioning that there are a couple of exemptions for small businesses in the private sector only and for businesses that are wholly overseas and that's the client so that the client is small or wholly overseas. Um, in those cases the original IR35 rules um, that were in place before all of these changes so the rules where it's the personal service company's problem and they have to decide whether or not it's employment or self-employment and operate tax those rules apply so if you are a small business in the private sector or a wholly overseas business, you don't have to worry about applying IR35. It's the intermediary or the personal service company's problem. And just um, a, a sort of brief overview, the small business test um, for companies and LLPs is the same as in the Companies Act. Um, there are three conditions and you have to meet at least two of them to be classed as small. And those three conditions are that annual turnover is no more than 10.2 million. Balance sheet total is no more than 5.1 million and there are no more than 50 employees. 
so it's quite a low bar. Um, you have to meet those tests in two consecutive tax years. And then for groups of companies, there is a, a similar test. You look at the group level and there are slightly higher thresholds. There's no size requirement for public authorities, so all public authorities are caught by the IR35 rules. Um, and then to be wholly overseas, you have to have no UK connections. That's looking at whether the client is UK resident or has a permanent establishment in the UK. So those are the exemptions. Um, the IR35 rules themselves, so the key points are that it's always up to the client to determine tax status. So the end client has to look at um, all of the factors and work out whether the person doing the work is an employee or self-employed for tax purposes. Um, that's the case whether you're contracting directly with the intermediary or with an agency. So you contract with the agency and the agency then contracts with the intermediary. You have to use reasonable care when you're making that decision. Um, so it's not acceptable to make blanket decisions and say, well, actually, we're just going to treat everybody, all of our contractors who are working through intermediaries as employees for tax purposes. You have to look at the individual facts and circumstances of each engagement. Um, that said, um, there's a slight relaxation of that. Um, HMRC will accept if you're contracting with a group of people, um, workers who are all doing the same thing on identical terms, then you can do a status determination for that group of people. <clears throat> and then once you've made your status determination, you have to provide a status determination statement, um, both to the worker directly and to the person you're contracting with. So if you have an agency in the chain, then you have to give that decision to the agency. I'll come back to that. I'm going to talk about status determination statements in a little bit more detail. And then it's the fee payer who has the obligation to operate PAYE if the decision is that the person's an employee for tax purposes. So client, if you're contracting directly with an intermediary, then you will always obviously be the fee payer. But if you have an agency in between you, then it's the agency that's classed as the fee payer. So you, the client, make the decision. The agency then has the liability and the obligation to operate PAYE in accordance with your decision. There are certain circumstances where that liability can be passed back if the client doesn't comply with all of its obligations under the rules though. And then next slide, James, please. So the status determination statement itself obviously has to say whether you think someone is employed or self-employed, but you also have to give the reasons for reaching that decision. And you have to give that status determination statement to um, the worker on or before uh, the date the contract starts, or if later, um, on or before the date the work starts. So it doesn't have to be in any particular set format. You don't have to come up with your own template for the status determination statement. You can use the HMRC online tool, which I'm sure you'll all be very familiar with by now, um, the Check Employment Status for Tax tool. So HMRC will accept that you know you go through the tool, put all your answers in, and it comes out with, um, with a result at the end, um, which has all of the information in there. You can give that um, as a printout or you know send that electronically to your uh, your worker and that will be a valid status determination statement. Um, then there's also in longer, this is only really relevant in longer supply chains if you have multiple agencies, there's an obligation for each party in the chain to pass the status determination statement on to the next and that's really to encourage compliance. So um, say you've got two agencies in between you and the intermediary, then you have to give that obviously to the worker the agency that you're contracting with, and then that agency has to then pass it on to the next agency. And failure to do that just results in the tax liability sitting with the non-compliant party. So the obligation to operate PAYE. And then the final point to bear in mind is that you have to have a status disagreement process. So if the worker, or um, if you're contracting with an agency, the agency disagrees with your decision and wants to challenge it, then there's a, a, st a statutory obligation to have a process in place to deal with that. So you obviously have to review any representations from the worker or the fee payer and respond within 45 days. Um, you know, you have to give that actual careful thought and, and set out why A, 
you know, if, if that's the case, why you think your decision was the right one, or if you agree with the person making the complaint, then you would have to give a new status determination statement and say that the old one's been withdrawn. Now, were we in a in real life, um, actual in the office having this discussion, we'd probably have a breakout group at this point to say, what's your experience of being of using the CES tool or other tools? Uh, but we're not. So please, can you give us some information in the Q and A to give us? Uh, uh, we have we have that on a poll actually coming up, James. So. I know, but I was still thinking that we could think ahead on that, and and there's a poll coming up. But share some experiences, a soup song of your. Yeah, be really good to hear. Yeah, because yeah. so so we're not just sitting in our ivory towers and we sit here bad bits from clients. Give us give us your views on uh, how those cess tests and other things work. Sorry, Carrie, back to you. No, I'm all done. I'm, I'll hand over to Kevin now to talk about the agency rules. Thanks, Gary. So um, that was the IR35 rules. So as we set out right at the start, they are relevant where you have an intermediary that is a personal services company, effectively. Um, what about where you are contracting with the agency and the agency is engaging somebody who is self-employed? So the agency rules are there to, to ensure that agencies that supply workers that look and feel like they're under the control of, of somebody uh, are paid through the agency's payroll. So this, this is not something that ends up with somebody on the, on the end client's payroll. And the bar is slightly lower than it is for um, if you're contracting directly with an individual or if you're looking at whether the employee would be an individual, were it not be, were it not for the intermediary, as Carrie's just been running through under the IR35 rules. So you really need just three things for the agency rules to apply. An individual who's personally performing services. So you've got all that, uh, all that stuff around substitution there. We're going to look at that when we're looking at um, employment and tax status shortly that the contract for the services is between the client and an agency, effectively. And this is the key one, that the manner in which the worker provides the services is subject to or to the right of supervision, direction, or control by any person. It only has to be capable of being exercised. It doesn't actually have to be exercised uh, in practice. So just popping on to the next slide, James. So what, what sort of issues do we see in practice with this? Well, as I've already said, if the agency rules apply, it's the agency's obligation to deal with PAYE and NIC is not the client. There is no need for a client to do a status determination. And that's quite important. People sometimes automatically default to that. There's no, no, no need to jump into the CES tool with this one. However, watch your contractual provisions because we've seen quite a lot of contracts um, between agents and clients where the contract actually includes a statement that there is no supervision, direction and control. And then of course, as you'd expect in those contracts elsewhere, not usually linked to that provision directly, but there are indemnities which say that uh, if, what, if, if the agency suffers a loss because of a breach of this contract, uh, then the end client will will put them in funds. Uh, and of course, if it has got a statement that there's no supervision and direction and control, and it turns out there is, then you would be in breach of that, that contract. And as we've already said, it is really sensible to check with the agency what the status of the particular individual is and how they're contracting with them. Uh, and as Carrie has said, IR35 rules take precedence. So if the individual it is using a company, then it's IR35 rules. If the, if the individual is, is contracting direct with the agency, uh, then it's these rules. So it's important that you know the difference when you're contracting with an agency and they're supplying you, particularly with multiple people as opposed to a one-off where it's a little bit easier. So we promised we would look at tax status. So this is relevant. Remember where you're contracting with the individual themselves or where you're having to look at the IR35 rule. So this is all the stuff from the, the CES tools. 
Now, for tax purposes, you're either employed or self-employed. Unlike with employment status, there is no intermediate worker status with a with a smaller uh, degree of rights. And of course, as we as we often say, an individual can, in theory, have different status for tax and employment law purposes. In particular, you could be employed for tax purposes, but just a worker for employment law purposes. That's quite common. You see that quite often. Um, generally speaking, if it if you're not employed for tax purposes, you're probably not going to be employed for employment law purposes as well. But there is it's not an automatic thing and it's always best to check. So how do you check? Um, well, it's not a checklist. All relevant factors have to be considered. But the importance of individual factors varies. As you'll know, um, if you're a uh, if you're a pro at using the, the CES tool, you'll know that there are two or three of those questions that are absolutely key. It's important to stand back and look at the whole picture. And it's important to realize that status can change over time. Somebody might come in as a self-employed consultant, very obviously they're in business providing that sort of thing, but then become so um, integral to your organization that actually they've moved on to other projects and over time, they may well have become an employee for tax purposes. So it's important to, to keep a close eye on those sorts of things during the course of the life of the relationship. So we're gonna look at, rather than going through every factor, because I don't think that's helpful, and I think everybody's aware that there's a multitude of these things, but we're gonna run through the three things that we see in practice as the, as the really key factors. So Carrie's gonna go through each of those in turn. But before we do that, should we do the poll? Yeah, um, let's have a look at that poll. So we mentioned uh, this earlier on, didn't we? Yeah, before we do that, can I, um, Rod has a very good question, which occurred to me, and I'm very glad you raised it, Rod. So let's do this now before we, um, we move on. He says, what is the definition of an agency? Now, that's, that is a very good question. Uh, there, is, there is a technical definition of that, and I'm not sure that I could recite it right now. Um, obviously, in most cases, you know what you're dealing with. As you'll remember if you, from the slide I put up there about agencies, um, it only actually has to be some sort of intermediary that you're contracting with. So in theory, that can apply to any entity. Yeah, agency is an umbrella term for something mm. that is an organization or it could be a person that is um, yeah. getting the services of somebody else to you if you're you if you're the client yeah but, yes indeed okay there's uh, a couple of other points I'm, I'm going to pick emma and amy's points up at the end because i think I, that's better now uh, so not to interrupt the flow is that all right with you that's absolutely fine <laughs> all right let's do the poll then yeah so presuming if you've used this tool how often do you receive the answer unable to determine which is a link to Emma's question but we'll come back to that yeah computer says no <laughs> that's my cultural reference for the day <laughs> <laughs> so we've had uh, getting up towards 100 people um yeah, but sorry. For people, come on, people. Uh, if you haven't voted yet, I'm going to count you down: five, four, three, two, one. Talk that's right. You. Yeah. So that that's quite interesting, isn't it? So actually, for most of you you have you don't get it all that often 12 percent of you get it for most of the time that's uh, <laughs> that's quite that's uh, unfortunate um but yeah a lot of you don't get that very much so that is interesting because we hear from clients a lot and maybe it's just because we we only tend to hear from clients when it's a difficult situation so we get this a lot 
that it's come out as unable to determine and therefore further advice is required. Okay, thank you everybody. Excuse me, sorry, I'm going to um, run through the three key factors um, that we tend to see as being the most important or the most significant when determining employment status for tax purposes. And they are certainly factors that are given more weight in HMRC's assessed, um, assessment tool. Um, and just worth flagging that, obviously, what the contract says um, is obviously important, but what tends to be crucial is what's actually happening in practice, because you can have a contract that ticks all of the right boxes for something to be self-employment for tax purposes but if what's happening on the ground is completely the opposite completely different and in practice the person is just acting as an employee for tax purposes then that contract's not really going to help you so you have to look at both the contractual position but also what happens in practice and then what happens in practice tends to be decisive so the first factor i'm going to talk about um jane's next slide please is personal service so that's a, well, it's a prerequisite, firstly, for IR35 to even apply. But as you'll remember from um, my brief run through of what is IR35, there has to be a person that is personally performing services for a client through an intermediary. So if there's no person personally performing services, then IR35 can't really apply at all. Um, it's also a prerequisite for there to be employment for tax purposes. But what we're looking at here is, do you want a specific person to do the work? Do you care who's doing the work for you? Or is that sort of less relevant as long as somebody is doing it? Um, you can obviously have a right of substitution. So if you're, you know, you might, you might have an individual who's contracted to do the work, but you might be prepared for them to send someone else to do it. If that's a completely unfettered right, so there are no conditions attached to that, you would accept anybody um, as long as they're suitably qualified um, and can do the work. Um, and ideally, um, if that right has been exercised, then that's going to be a really strong indicator that there's no personal service and that this is self-employment for tax purposes. But what often happens is that there may be a right of substitution in the contract, um, but it's never been used. Um, you know, the question then is, would you genuinely be able to use it? Um, HMRC would look at, you know, various different things in terms of whether you'd accept a substitute if the worker was simply unwilling to do the work rather than unable, um, perhaps because they were ill or, or on holiday or something. Um, and they'll also look at whether it's an unqualified right or whether the client has the right to reject a substitute for any reason. So obviously, if you could reject anyone for any reason, then that's not really going to show that there's a right of substitution. That wouldn't be a genuine right. Um, and then the other thing that HMRC looks at, and this is um, in their guidance on the SETS tool, is whether substitution would be practical or plausible. Um, so is it realistic that somebody could actually send a substitute in practice? So if you have someone, which is often the case, who is essentially a one person company, it's only that person who, who does that work through that company, they don't have anybody else that they can call upon, then would they be able to find a substitute or send a substitute? Um, if the answer to that is no, then you know it's unlikely um, that this is going to be a genuine right of substitution and there will be personal service. But obviously, personal service on its own isn't decisive. That's not the only factor. And then you'd look at other factors, but it is obviously a pointer towards employment for tax purposes. Um, so the next factor um, I'm going to look at is control. Just before we do that, I, I will just very briefly mention from an employment perspective, the mm. case always very much going uh, a fettered right of substitution is not attractive. Uh, um, an unfettered right to substitute is the, is the way forward when drafting these contracts from an employment perspective. We're seeing yeah. with Uber and all of those cases. So be very wary of historic uh, arrangements, which hopefully you'll have gone through the CES tool uh, in relation to. So, um, yeah, and there's always the commercial balance to be struck to, to be struck as well, because obviously, you know, you might not commercially be able to accept yeah. just any substitute. <laughs> OK, so the next factor, control. Um, and control can obviously be exhibited in a number of ways, but what we're really looking at is control over what, um, where, when and how the work is done. Um, it's enough if there's a 
you know, similar to the supervision, direction and control tests that Kevin mentioned in the agency rules, um, it's enough for there to be a right to control um, what, where, when and how the work is done. Um, it doesn't have to be a right that's exercised in practice. Um, that said, since the COVID pandemic um, and the move towards much more flexible working arrangements for employees, control over where and I think in some cases when the work is done can be a lot less significant as a factor. Um, because if you've got employees who are working flexibly when and where they want to, then it's you know not going to be an indicator of employment. So it will depend very much on the circumstances. Um, control over how the work is done can be very important, but in circumstances where you have someone who's highly skilled and experienced, you wouldn't expect um, control to be exercised over how the work is done. Um, even if that person were an employee, you wouldn't expect the client to be able to exercise that kind of control. So that can be a less significant factor in those circumstances. Um, it's also it can be relevant if there is a framework of control in place. And that sort of means if there's if there are some kind of um, practices, internal practices or policies or, or procedures or ways of doing things that have to be followed by the person seeing the work, then that can be an indicator that there is control. But the key question um, regarding control, certainly from HMRC's perspective in the CES tool, seems to be whether the client has the ability to move the individual from the original task that they were engaged to do onto something new. Um, so, and that would be at will, you know, based on business decisions or business priorities. Can you just say, right, we want you to do this today or that today or move you to something completely different without the worker having to consent to that or without having to enter into a new contractual arrangement. Um, if that's the case, and that does tend to be a very strong indicator of employment for tax purposes. Um, so in those cases, it can be, it would be better um, if you do have someone that you want to be able to move onto a new project or a new task to enter into a new contractual arrangement with them. But the risk there and the danger is that if you keep doing that on a consecutive basis, so you're just contracting with one person over a long period of time, but under separate contracts for different things, then you get a pattern um, that can point to um, a more sort of overarching employment relationship. And it's, you know, as Kevin mentioned, status can change over time. So might start out with someone being genuinely self-employed but then they become more integrated and ingrained within your organization and you keep using them for different things and status can change so that's something to bear in mind and then the final factor that i'll talk about is um, whether the individual is in business for themselves and that tends to be it tends to be the case that you know it when you see it so is it clear that the person is in business on their own account they're not working as part and parcel of your organization they're not working within your business itself um, and if that's the case then they won't be an employee for tax purposes and that can be exhibited in a number of ways um, for example do they perform similar services regularly for a collection of different clients so you're not their only client they're not dependent on you and there's no sort of exclusivity there um, do they set the price for the work that they're doing or do they set their own hourly rate um, or do you? If something's done wrong, would they have to put it right without charging you for it? Um, is there a set price for the job? So if they're you know, delivering a particular project and there's a timescale for that, is there a real financial risk to them if they are inefficient? So if they take longer to do it um, or is there a real opportunity to profit if they can do it more quickly and more efficiently? Um, that tends to be, you know, a, an indicator that there is um, self-employment for tax purposes. Um, something that may not be obvious, um, it might be harder to, to ascertain, um, is whether the individual has had to incur significant capital expenditure to be able to provide the services. So did they have their own business costs, for example, a website, um, business premises, do they have um, costly equipment that they use to do the job for you? Um, do they hold themselves out as a business? You know, is it clear to um, a third party or to a customer, would it be obvious that they are not part of your um, business you know they're not an employee they are a self-employed contractor they have their own business um, and on the flip side you know if you've got somebody who looks like your employee to um, to a third party you know 
know, if you're going back to the sort of most basic level, if they're sort of wearing their your uniform, if they have, um, you know, a job title and an email signature, those are all things that can point to integration and towards employment for tax purposes. So that brings me to the end of, of those factors. And then um, unless, James, you've got any comments from an employment perspective, I'll hand over to Kevin to talk about some of the practical issues. Uh, no, that's a separate issue. Thanks. OK, and there's a couple of questions that have come up about some of the things that Carrie's talked about. So we'll deal with those shortly. So I was just going to raise quickly these five points. So what so how how what are your issues? What do you need to go through? Well, most importantly, you need to know who your off payroll workers are. And quite often this, the knowledge about this isn't just in one place, as you'll all know, because you're all integral to your own organisations. It might be in purchasing, it might be in HR. Uh, or it might be in business units themselves. So it's really important um, that you that you know who your payroll workers are, and that then you've got robust processes for for assessing the situation. You need to look at your contracts, make sure that you've got the contractual protections that you need. You can't protect for anything, for everything, but it will help you if you've got the right obligations in there uh, for people to provide you with the right sort of information so you can make the decisions that you need to take. As James has mentioned on a couple of occasions, you've got to think about the employment consequences as well uh, about the arrangements that you're you're putting in place. and. It may well be that you say, oh, well, we'll put we'll put this group of people on the payroll because it just avoids any issues with tax. Well, obviously, that's going to have some some consequences potentially for the rights that they have for employment purposes. And of course, we all see and, and you know, we see quite commonly clients coming to us and saying, well, we think we're applying the rules correctly, um, but our competitor down the road isn't. And it's causing us a real problem. So. You know, what can we do about that? What leeway have we got? And it's a case then of looking at, at what they need as an end result, really, and thinking about how the best way to deliver that might be, uh, rather than necessarily just falling back on the way that, that they've done things uh, to date. And that might mean a slight change in models uh, in order to win that battle for talent. Well, we promised to let you all go by uh, 10 45 and there's a couple of questions so uh, james i didn't know whether you wanted to pick up some of those uh sure so um emma says i do tend to find the hmrc tool comes out as unable to determine quite regularly any advice or is it best practice to treat it as inside in this instance and i'll stop sharing the slides any views on that yeah i think well there, there's a lot of HMRC guidance that can be very helpful. So I think the first port of call is to, you know, to have a look at that and see if you can take a view yourself. I, I don't think it's necessarily best practice to treat it inside. It would just obviously depend on, on the circumstances. But obviously, if you think that it's going to be closer to the line and there is a risk um, of it falling inside, then you need to satisfy yourself, you know, that you're, you're doing the right thing from a tax perspective. And then obviously, you can take professional advice, you know, from people like us. Um, if, you know, if you do need that, that sort of um, that extra advice and that extra determination. Um, Kevin, I don't know if you've got any thoughts. No, I'd agree, Kerry. Unable yeah. to determine doesn't give you the protection, does it? Because it's it's sitting no, exactly. on the fence. So, so treating that as inside means you've made a leap that the CES tool outcome doesn't give you. Um, okay. Uh, Amy says, how would this apply to outsourced service contracts? For example, a security or catering contract, would that be classed as an agency contract? No, because you're not you're not there being supplied with people. You're being supplied with a service, and it's clear. It should be clear from both the contractual arrangements and from what's happening in practice that what you're actually getting is a product, is a service, uh, rather than people. Um, and obviously, there you probably haven't got personal service. The um, the entity you're contracting with will have held themselves out as being in business on their own account. And there may even be a lim only a limited amount of control in terms of sort of what's wrong, what needs to be done, that sort of thing. So going through those key factors. Okay. Jennifer says, do you think that someone who works in a highly regulated safety focused industry with a huge amount of mandatory policy and procedure can ever truly fall outside of IR35? Uh, yes, I would say, because, yeah. um, because you know it's accepted that to work in certain areas you have to comply with you know mandatory safety 
um, standards. I mean, working in hospitals, perhaps just as just as relevant to that as as working on a railway, which was uh, Jennifer's question, I think. So, so yes, if it's absolutely fundamental that whoever steps foot inside that building or that facility has got to act in a certain way, then that's not necessarily uh, a, a, a relevant factor. It's neutral, in other words. And I agree, there's, a, there's an anonymous question about if you have a security betting issue, does that cause any problems in relation to the right of substitution? My view is, if somebody needs to have, for example, the right to work in the UK, you need to go through certain processes. That's a, a justified fetter, in my view. Mm. So, yeah, I'm just going to skip on a little bit in the interest of time. Um, yes, Ian, slides available will be later. Um, is it correct that both IR35... Let me try that again. Is it correct that the IR35 determination only need to be undertaken where both the contract is with the intermediary and the intermediary is receiving payment for the services? So if either one of those factors isn't satisfied, but the contract is with the individual, then IR35 isn't engaged? Well, ultimately, it's about who is supplying what services to whom. Okay. Uh, it sounds here like the contract isn't accurate. Fair enough. Um, well, if, and if you're contracting with an individual, then it's always your obligation to determine status and to operate anyway, PAYE yeah. accordingly. So if they just, if it's just that you're contracting with an individual, but they want you to make the payment to someone else, um, then it's you know you still need to consider their tax status and make the appropriate deductions. Yeah, I'd really look at I'd really look at your contract in that in that situation. Um, two, yes. two very two very quick quick ones. What happens if you contract with a consultancy slash supplier with various employees and you have a key person under the contract? Would this be caught by R35? We always try to. It, we we would always try to uh, avoid identifying a named individual. Okay. But it also depends, you know, is what you're contracting with an intermediary? So if is the person providing the work, do they have a material interest in that company? You know, is it their personal service company? Because if it's not, um, and if everyone's employed, if you're contracting with that company, but everyone's employed by them and on their payroll, then you won't have a tax issue. Great. All right. Last Last one. Uh, what are the penalties if you fail to adhere to IR35? For example, your SDT was incorrect when assessed by HMRC. You've got 30 seconds. You have to pay the tax and you have to pay interest on the tax. And there is a penalty regime with with penalty with payroll taxes as well. And it would depend there on, uh, on your level of you know, who spotted the error and whether you've been cooperative in, in dealing with that with the tax authorities. Okay. The person who's, who said uh, the question about non-UK residents, if you contact one of us um, at our usual email addresses for me, james.kid at mills-reeve.com, we can pick that up separately because I don't know who you are because you're anonymous. Uh, thank you for the person who said, what a great webinar. I hope the rest of you feel the same. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd like to say thank you very much to Carrie and to Kevin. I certainly learned a lot. Good refresher for me on our 35. Um, please look out for the next of our series of in-house in focus.